and everyone, we are live on the Gamification Revolution. Hello, I'm your host, Gabe Zickerman. It is a uh, pretty good, starting to feel like spring day in New York City, uh, where I am very excited about so much stuff to share with you today. And I am joined by the amazing and talented Ross Smith, who's right now in Redmond, Washington. Hello, Ross. Hey there. I have a, uh, I'm hearing a lot of echo, so I apologize if I sound a little bit off. I can kind of make it, uh, um, <laughs> a lot of but anyway, thank you for having me. Get some headphones. Uh, Get some headphones. Okay. Get, can you have some floating around. Yeah, one second. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. While we wait for Ross to get a set of headphones, I, you guys, I have to tell you something. What are you what are you more excited about right now than first of all this new amazing uh, vision of Spreecast? I don't know if you get to see it the way that I get to see it, but it's actually really cool for us. We have a completely new update. And if you want to be able to see it and you actually want to be able to participate in our chat today, you're going to want to log into Spreecast with one of your social networking accounts. Facebook. Twitter, LinkedIn, whatever makes you excited. You log into Spreecast. That gives you access to all of the information that you possibly can get. You can see and hear everything. You can chat with us. You can actually come on camera. You can ask us questions, which we'll then bring on the screen. It's kind of amazing. It's kind of amazing, super amazing. You can't even do better than what it is that we're doing right now here on Spreecast. So make sure that you log in. Now, also, I want to say, um, which I'm very excited about separately, that G Summit is coming up. It's June 10th through the 13th in San Francisco. It's gsummit.com, and you can save $200 off your ticket right now by using the code GAMREV, by using the code GAMREV to come to the, to the show in June. And you guys, it's going to be amazing. I don't know if you got the emails this morning, but I really hope that you did. If you haven't already registered, we've got... Part of our keynotes for this year, we've got Neil deGrasse Tyson. We have Professor B.J. Fogg from Stanford. And we have announced this morning, you didn't know, Jane McGonigal, who many of you know as the author of Reality is Broken, famous evangelist for the use of games in all kinds of contexts. Jane is also confirmed, and she's going to be joining us on the main stage at G-Summit. You guys, what a crazy, incredible, 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 incredible schedule. Can you believe how amazing the schedule is? We've got all of these people coming, all of these amazing people. And there's 50 more from all these cool companies, Mazda, O-Power, um, you know, GWT. Uh, it's amazing. So good. So cool. So much to do and so much to see. And the conference is actually shaping up to be amazing. Whether you're doing marketing, you're doing customer engagement, you're doing employee engagement, no matter what it is that you're doing, this is the absolute most concentrated set of experts in the whole world on the subject of the topic of engagement of every kind, and you have to come. Now, Seamus is saying that it's a, a rock star event. Thanks, Seamus, and thanks to all of you who are here with us regularly and always tune in for Gamification Revolution every week. It's amazing that we have this community and you're all here, um, and I'm hoping to see many of you in June. Uh, I, of course, am, uh, I, of course, am working very hard on you know, what I'm going to talk about, like BJ is going to be talking about his new research that he's done on, on changing behavior, on connecting short-term behavior to long-term behavior. Jane is going to be talking about new research that she's working on connecting games to positive health outcomes, particularly around Super Better and some of the other things that she's doing. Uh, Professor Tyson is going to be talking about, um, you know, how what he's accomplished in terms of being able to uh, uh, connect people, connect people to engagement, transform engagement. So everybody's got something to say. I've got to have something to say too. It's a very, very important that I work diligently on, uh, on my efforts to say something interesting to you. But I have no doubt that when you come there, you will absolutely see me deliver the engagement um, excellence that you're used to, a speech that will make you very, very proud. Now, I also want to say, for the record, for all of you who, uh, who can't make it, right now there's a funny conversation going on. Uh, Yaron, that I hope I'm pronouncing that right, Yaron and David Piguero uh, talking about how they gamify their trip to the actual conference. Um, and yeah, you guys, I, I don't know if you know this, but you can actually win a free ticket to G Summit every week on Twitter. We have a giveaway 
um, to actually win a free ticket. So you can at least potentially talk your way into a free ticket. Of course, you can get a cheap ticket by using the code up there, but maybe you can talk your way into a free ticket to GSUM and then all you've got to do is get yourself there. How amazing is that, right? Now, Ross, can you hear us? Yes, all set. Sorry about that. I was I had uh, no, no double a double dose of Gabe. So we're all set now. You know, is it ever enough though? Can you really I, ever have enough Gabe? You, you can't. You can't. So <laughs> I I'm teasing. I'm teasing. There actually is often too much. Okay, so Ross, now that we've got you back, now that you're here, and you're there in in lovely Seattle. All right. So tell us what it is that you do at Microsoft, which everybody knows is a software company. Tell us what you do at Microsoft, and though, though most people have seen you already because you've been a past speaker at G-Summit, uh, and many people have heard about your work even separately from that, um, tell us a little bit about how you come to the subject of using you know, gamification, game concepts to, in your work. Sure, I'll kind of give you a little history. So my, my day job, I'm director of test in Skype. Um, which is a great audio video chat uh, mechanism. Um, similar <laughs> to what we're doing here, as a matter of fact. Uh, but um, going back uh, to actually early in the Windows Vista timeframe, we have a uh, we have a quality process where uh, we encourage people to sort of enroll their machines in a centralized system overnight, and we use them to run a bunch of tests to exercise the exercise the product before we release. And the uh, the, the process is very beneficial to the quality of the software, uh, but the, any given individual, if their machine happens to find a bug, they may not be able to use it the next day because it's required for debugging. So, so the cost to the individual, there's not a lot of benefit to the individual in, in participating in this program. So as a result, we get sort of varied participation. And, and one of our VPs at the time had kind of challenged us to think about how could we engage people and get more participation? Because the typical process is send broad email and then a higher level manager sends broader email and all the way up. And, and uh, so we had an intern at the time who we, uh, we were exploring kind of the use of game theory, not games for entertainment per se, but sort of prisoner's dilemma kind of stuff. Could we, could we build some um, checks and balances in to get people to participate? And then that got us ex just thinking about games in general. So we built a little simple hangman game, um, which I have learned is not universally known as <laughs> hangman. So, uh, Different cultures see it a different way, but the game where you have you have to guess and earn a letter and spell a word, and um, right. and so the, we had spell beta one was the thing, and so we rolled this out a little web based thing, and basically if you participate overnight, you earn the letter B. If you do it three days in a row, you earn the letter E, and so on. And uh, we saw tremendous results, four times uh, in increase in participation, literally overnight, um, just by playing it. This game, we had a, sim a simple leaderboard that ordered the, the players, and uh, and that kind of made us realize, hey, there's there's something here, and so from there, we uh, we kind of experimented, and and over really like the last ten years, have really learned a lot about where games uh, where games can make a difference and where they can really hurt. Um, the the obvious example is uh, what I call the well, there's a couple different versions of this. There's the Do Ross's Job game. Or the do more work badge, <laughs> the clean Ross's house badge. Um, that the uh, <clears throat> that the competition between a, a game at work, and, or the con competition and conflict between a game at work and the traditional reward system can cause a lot of confusion and ang anxiety and and uh, animosity, because you know people are already coming to work presumably for a paycheck or for other reasons. And then when you sprinkle points in there, they get confused and, okay, am I doing this for points or are you trying to trick me using these gamification techniques, trying to trick me into doing more work? So we've learned a lot of, we pay a lot of tuition on where games work and where they don't. So let me ask you this question about, um, about that issue that you just brought up, which is, you know, at first, obviously people might feel resentful or have concerns about that or all of those different issues around, you know, are, is the company just trying to cheat me into doing more work? Can you talk more about how you deal with that over time and how the perception of that idea of the integration of gamification in the workplaces has shifted at Microsoft or at Skype? Yeah, well, so we, we are very careful about where we deploy game accounts so to avoid exactly that situation. So I don't think... I mean, I, I think it's possible if you had an integrated system where, you know, the, the, the value of 
game mechanics is they give instant feedback. A lot of the things that gamers get, employees would want, right? I, I can go if I'm, you know, I'm, I encounter a, a fire-breathing dragon and I pick up a sword and he, and he flames me to death, I realize the sword wasn't the right tool. Whereas in the workplace, I might perform a, a certain process and I might not find out for six months till my uh, annual evaluation whether that was the right tool or not. So games, the instantaneous feedback that games give is, is a great addition to traditional reward systems, but we don't have we don't have that sort of authority or integration between sort of paycheck and points. So we try and focus on areas uh, what we call organizational citizenship behaviors, things that people can do to help the organization that are not necessarily part of their job. So there's a lot of value to us in Skype if a, say, a marketing manager or a human resources professional or a finance person uses our product because they're going to be more similar to, to our customers than the engineer who's working on a particular feature. So in order to get them to install sort of a pre-release version and try out certain scenarios, give us feedback, send us logs, using game mechanics in that world can help them, you know, and, and it's not, using Skype is not necessarily part of their day job. They're not rewarded one way or another, whether they find bugs the way somebody on the team is, and they actually are a better representation of our customer. So it makes a lot of sense to be able to use game mechanics out there. Do you think that this would be the same, or can you talk to a little bit about the culture of Microsoft and the culture of Skype and how that influences it? Because I've had many Microsoft friends over the years, Ross, and I know that the, the organization can be maybe a little bit more, uh, certainly can be maybe a little bit more cult-like, mm -hmm. and I don't mean that in a bad way, I just mean, you know, there's a shared hive mind there. There's a belief in helping out the for the greater good of the company, uh, minus all the competitive stuff internally. Um, you know, also potentially this idea of, of, you know, feeling sometimes like, you know, you've got to, uh, you know, do your best and pitch in. Can you talk about that, how that influences it? I know that's the only place that you work, but is it helping you? Is it hurting you? Does that really matter? Does it make a difference that Microsoft is the way that it is? Um, you know, I think I, I, what we've learned is kind of everybody's different and, uh, and uh, games when we've done our games, we've really tried to build in as many elements of the different types of games. So there's the glory and shame of the leaderboard, which is uh, which is motivating to some people, and and interestingly, in some cultures, it actually works against against your goals because if the if the manager is be below the team on the leaderboard, the team's going to stop playing until the manager catches up. And so, mm. so what we've done is so we think about you know, player versus player, um, but then also beat your own high school or player versus self will motivate some people. And then player versus environment. So things like puzzles and hidden treasures and things like that motivate other people. And then we've also done some stuff where uh, you, uh, we've, we've themed a couple games around disaster preparedness and disaster relief. And so people will play for the sake of others. So so really trying to, to get a little bit of everything so that uh, you, you address, regardless of the cultural nuances of, of whether it's team by team or individual by individual, you get a little bit of something for everybody. So I want to turn that question around the other way and, and uh, you know, hopefully it's not, you don't feel like we're dwelling on something that, that isn't meaningful to you, but I'm, I'm curious about this. So Nicola asked in chat about, do people not want to sign up for gamification stuff because of the personal details or, or free information in the company? And so I want to ask you, because you're dealing with a, a closed employee population predominantly with the stuff that you're doing, how do you handle data privacy issues in general when you're doing gamified uh, uh, services there at Microsoft? Do you need someone else's help? Or how do you guys navigate the waters of privacy with the employee population? Oh, that's interesting, yes. Um, so we have a... Uh, uh, we have a, a number of privacy practices around sort of product development that we, we, so we are very clear on sort of what we can, what, what's personal identifiable information, what's not. So we will, uh, we don't really collect a whole lot um, uh, sort of in, in, this, in the context of the game. Um, we'll look at sort of product logs and things like that, which we have a, um, policies internally that govern you know, that type of stuff, what type of telemetry we can collect and product information. And then as far as the game, we may or may not. We ha we've had some where, every, because we're going in this organizational citizenship area, everything is voluntary, right? It's a, the, the magic circle of play is something you enter voluntarily and it's fun because you can leave. And so right. um, 
So everything we do is kind of, you know, opt in at an individual level. So, uh, and, you, you know, usually we'll just, people will sign up with an email and that's probably once in a while. We've done a couple where we uh, have tried to group people by, you know, favorite color or sports teams, things like that. Um, but we don't collect a lot of personal details in the context of our game. And it sounds like it's not even, is it even necessary for what you do? Or are you not collecting because you're afraid of collecting them or, or not doing it because it's not, you don't really need to? Yeah, don't need to. Uh, so um, I want to go back to something that you said a little bit earlier, which, uh, which folks were talking, uh, kind of talking about a little bit in chat, which is about the question of competition. And you made reference to a specific example of the uh, team holding for the manager to come up to their level. Can you talk a little bit about that? I think you were also going to talk about the kind of cultural, yeah. maybe national or cultural you know, differences in that, like I know that mix there. When I play myself you know, as, a, as a manager, I'm motivated. If the, if the team all flies by me, I'm motivated to take action. Um, and But that's, you know, U.S. I, and in other cultures, the, the sort of the team is, is more respectful of the manager, maybe. I don't know what the right word is there, but um, maybe it's just me. But the... Uh, um, the idea of the manager should be on the top, right? And so uh, it does, they will wait until the manager moves up before moving up themselves, which goes against what we're trying to accomplish in the game. You really want just more players playing all the time. And so, uh, so in in different areas, the, you know, we'll have all the different mechanics available, but some may be emphasized more than others depending on sort of the flavor of the, the region. So is there a particular, have you, you know, you've done this, Russ, you guys have done this for longer than uh, just about any company doing this in the space. And in fact, in a couple of days, we'll have Mario Herger here, uh, who was at SAP, who kind of started out doing it, I think, around the same time that you did. So now it's been a number of years that you've been trying this. Can, I, I hate to ask you to make generalizations, but can you give people any insight about, you know, um, different parts of the world or different cultural groups that maybe are more amenable to this or places where you've really said, ah, you know what, our model doesn't work or we have to really tweak the model of what we're doing here to kind of uh, work in this environment? Because each, you, you can find counterexamples everywhere, right? And it's really, you know, I, th I think one one thing that we've learned, you know, as sort of a, a best practice that we've taken away from this is instrument the game and understand what components are are resonating with your players. Um, we've been very rigorous about data collection. This, this, this allows you to thwart any non-believers um, because you can have A-B comparisons say, here's, here's a beta program run with the game and here's one without and here's the, the differences in, in feedback. But also it allows you to see, okay, how many people are visiting the leaderboard versus trying to explore a puzzle? Um, how many are checking their own scores? Uh, so you can tailor to, uh, to, to different really to individual players, but certainly in regions um, that the, the people who are playing in those regions are going to know what's resonating with people. If, if, if there's a tendency from a specific area of the world, those people will know and will just emphasize, you know, what's important to them. We don't try and do a big centrally managed sort of push to, to play. Ah, okay. That's interesting. So uh, there's a bunch of questions queuing up that I want to get to, but I just want to dig in on that for one second. So uh, how important is the administrative interface of the things that you're building? Because often when we talk about it, yeah. we're really only talking about the, the, the uh, user-facing side of the stuff that you've built. What about the Ross Smith-facing well, side so, of the stuff so that you built? And, a lot of it is just and, and how about how much effort goes into that? And what are some of the interesting things you've learned? There? And, you know, it's not, we don't put a lot of effort into the Sort of the administrative interface, but one thing that we we have found is is tremendously valuable is sort of the concept of the game master. That there is a host, that there is a person that is paying attention. Because what happens is, you know, if you and I are both playing and, and you're four times as good as I am, uh, I'm going to stop playing because I'll never catch you, right? And so uh, the game master can start to see uh, where skill sets may be different or scoring may be different and then learn from that and tune. Maybe it's something we keep the duration short so we, we try not to change the rules once we start, but uh, we can learn for the next one. Or if people have 
questions about, hey, I'm missing the letter E. Who do I go to? Right. So there's a, there's a there's a human that is the, the game master and will take on sort of the administrative role as sort of the face to the players. And then on the back end, um, a lot of our stuff is just pulling from <clears throat> traditional product data that we would have anyways, uh, and then turning that into some sort of score or puzzle or something like that. So we'll use a lot of database stuff in the back end, but no, we don't really build a special interface for the administrator. So, uh, so Dutch asked whether or not a game master is kind of like a community manager, and I guess it's sort of. So it sounds like yes, and I guess in certain regions, yeah, right, so we, you might have somebody who you know, where, where delegated to really run that, like in your Hong Kong office. You can play that role, and then uh, and then we'll uh, also make sure we have someone central who's available uh, in case there's questions or. Right, and you've got to do the analytics at some point to prove to the management team that this was worth doing and to walk around and say, look at the stuff that we've accomplished, right? So you've got to be able to extract some analytics from the back end, uh, you know, to be able to communicate internally, I guess. Uh, let's switch gears for a second, because you talked about a disaster preparedness game before, and that got people's attention in the chat, and Seamus, um, you know, made a Sheldon Cooper joke, but I, I just um, uh, want to bring you back to uh, the question of this disaster preparedness uh, game experience. Can you tell us more about that? out a, a big beta and um, of uh, Link, which is the enterprise version of uh, equivalent of Skype. Um, so it's audio video, kind of like what we're using here. Uh, and uh, and the the thought was, you know, to roll out. We had you know, several thousand people for for a beta, and as as we saw earlier on, when you're making a video call and you have problems, it can be Quite disruptive and so sometimes people have emotions around that and being the cause of the emotion we thought we might want to make it a little more inspiring to help us out and give us feedback and so we uh, we picked five uh, disaster relief agencies and um, and people would uh, install the product use it a certain way uh, follow some instructions on scenarios to try and then give us feedback both structured feedback as well as ad hoc and and test logs, and um, and they would earn points for the charity that they had uh, signed up for. And then each charity had two uh, sort of captains, which uh oh, Just go there. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, good. good. Uh, I thought I lost you there for a sec. But um, so each each charity would have two captains, and they became sort of the game masters for that. For that group. Oh yeah, we still got your ass. And uh, yeah, and then we played for about a month. Um, played or basically ran the beta, and then at the end we gave away a bunch of money to the five charities, apportioned by the points that each group had earned. And what we saw was compared to a, a the exact same size beta, exact same duration a year earlier, we saw 16 times the amount of feedback compared to to earlier, and we had. Uh, uh, more than two thirds of the of the people who had signed up to play the game gave us feedback versus three percent of people who did not play the game. So saw so a lot of engagement and a lot of people did comment. It was because it was not necessarily because it was game, but because it was for a good cause that they felt compelled to, to participate. So. So, so let's dig in on that because that's spectacular, right? That is a spectacular effect. And, you know, in fact, just last week we were talking a little bit about, you know, uh, with uh, John Carter from Mogul uh, here on the show, we were talking about, uh, you know, doing uh, restaurant, going to restaurants for good and, and sponsoring other people. The topic of getting people to do a beneficial action that has a business purpose but also supports charity, a kind of double or triple bottom line thing, you know, has become very sort of popular. Um, and obviously, there's there's great now. There's more and more data to back it up. Can you um, talk about the process of kind of coming to that conclusion? Did that did it catch you off guard how it's successful it was? Have, um, have you tried that? that um, you know, adding a charity component to that in other ways? Are you just now that we know that it works so well? Are we just going to make every activity into a charity-based activity? Uh, but we're surprised that the 
at the numbers that they were that, that it was that dramatic. Because as I mentioned on the early games, we saw about four times the level of participation when we sort of gamified an activity. But this gave us 16 times, which is which is certainly much higher. Um, and I think the you know the feedback from a lot of people was that was was the charity aspect, not necessarily the game aspect. So um, I think it's it's one of these where we have we have tried to do uh, we on our next big rollout we will do another similar one um, around this time around disaster preparedness and and raising awareness of what Microsoft and a couple of other uh, NGOs do around. Uh, disaster relief and preparedness and using our technology and there's some great uh, stuff in Skype that, uh, that is very helpful you know when you don't have cell phone lines you can make a phone call with, with an, an internet connection and um, so to raise awareness of players for that will sort of be our next uh, our next big rollout but uh, I'm not exactly sure when we'll do that but I think there is there is potential to sort of stitch in um, goodness into into the gamifying of uh, citizenship. So, what about and this whole con the whole concept of you know kind of driving a citizenship through these games makes uh, you know the charity elements of them seem much more relevant, right? That that really connects the dots because it's this whole idea of being a good citizen in the Microsoft environment. What about that? Uh, an incentive, either a charity incentive or a direct cash incentive or something, when we're talking about other activities that are maybe less yeah, connected to um, um, it's, that it's sense of higher purpose, we, but maybe have, you know when we really specifically are just trying to get people to do some hardcore QA in the short term. Can you talk to uh, to that sort of challenge? Okay, the, you know we right. learned about. Uh, where games work and where they don't, and who plays and who doesn't, and who's doing their job and who's not, and and so uh, what we what we do if we do give sort of prizes, we'll try and make it right. random. And again, because we don't know the exchange rate for labor. Again, if you're four times better than I am, you know, as as a as a host of the game, we want both of us playing, right? Even though you're four times faster, I'm still contributing. So uh, if there's a prize. Again, I'm going to stop once you're way ahead. But if if we make uh, sort of random, so you have four tickets in the fishbowl and I have one, um, I still have a chance. I'm going to still keep playing uh, for the sake of a chance to win. It, and I'm not going to feel like, well, I'm not going to bother playing because he's so much better than I am. And so it's really, you know, where we do do it, we try and add an element of randomness so that everybody, and then if, if I happen to win, even though you did four times as much as me, you feel like, okay, well, he was lucky in the drawing, and you feel less disenfranchised by the contribution. Yeah, I think that's uh, yeah. So uh, let me ask you a question, which is maybe a little bit meta, Ross, that keys off a question from Dutch in our chat, who asked whether or not there's published results from these efforts. Now, you know, I know you tweet under the uh, the uh, uh, Twitter handle 42 projects and everyone should follow you because I think, you know, you do incredible stuff there. And I know that in the past you've been pretty diligent about writing up the work that you've done, publishing the work that you've done, being very very forthcoming with the community overall, and I can't thank you enough for being such a like so vocal about the things that you've done and being so open at sharing them. I think it really helps everybody not just you know in internally but externally uh, to understand that and you're cha you know you're um, sort of championing this is, is very important to everyone. So one question that I have, I guess, two questions for you. The first one is, what does it take to get the company to let you talk about this stuff publicly? Because there's many people who are watching us who are in your shoes doing gamification projects in their yeah, organization well, thank you. I, and, I and sometimes potentially uh, struggling uh, with uh, you know how they share that information with the public. And, and then our, second of all, what can we expect to see, if anything, in terms of you know, um, you know, more a, data either at your talk at G Summit or, or going forward uh, from there? And everyone's kind of learning together, so the more forthcoming we can be uh, about sort of where games awesome. work, where you know what numbers we've seen. Um, and it's been, you know, the uh, I think the fact that it is sort of relatively new, I guess, it's not new per se anymore, but um, 
uh, that the um, the idea of sort of sharing so that it, it can everyone can learn from our mistakes. I mean, if we're paying tuition to learn where they don't work, then we Oh, and I think we just briefly lost Ross as he was about to very, uh, very gently, politely, and in a lovely way tell us that he's going to continue to publish information at 42 Projects. And I do want to encourage you all actually to go to 42projects.org and check out everything that Ross actually is publishing and everything that he's doing uh, you know, to advance gamification in the enterprise at Microsoft. Really amazing stuff. He's a great guy, and he'll be joining us at G Summit. Um, along with 50 or so other speakers, myself included, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Professor B.J. Fogg, Jane McGonigal, who all of you know, plus all these other great companies, um, you know, to talk about the things that they've accomplished and the things that they've done and share the latest in research and get hands-on on the subject of engagement. And I don't know if we'll get Ross back before the show ends, but there you are. Ross, hello. Welcome I don't know back. what happened there. I just, my video stopped. But. No, it's no problem. Before we lose, before we go, because we're about to wrap up um, the show because we're running out of time, Sasha did have one question for you, which is Ribbon Hero 3. Is there going to be a Ribbon Hero 3? Can you just briefly uh, talk, tell everybody what Ribbon Hero is and if there are any plans to kind of advance that before we go? Yeah, so uh, Ribbon Hero is a game not from us, uh, from the office team, uh, yes. which... Um, was uh, was designed to teach people to use the features of Office. Uh, I'm not sure. You know, I can I can find out. I don't know off the top of my head if there is another one planned or not. But uh, I can find out, and I'll maybe at G Summit I can I'll I'll, I'll let Gabe know and and uh, what I find, and then you can mention it in a future. Fantastic, fantastic. I know Sasha is interested in it because he's tasked often with. You know, helping people understand how to do stuff, and sometimes I think even with Microsoft products internally at McKinsey. So I'm sure that there's a lot of interest in you know extending that out. Um, you know, whether it's cheesy or awesome. So Ross, 42 Projects is how people can follow you on Twitter and 42projects.org, right? If they want to find out more. Yep. Yep. Thank absolutely. You. And and uh, my uh, my email is rosss at Microsoft. And so if anybody's got questions or can, wants more information or can find anything. And your pronunciation is good enough. You don't have that sibilant S where we can't tell how many S's that was. That was like not eight S's. I think it was just three S's right after the RO. Um, Ross Smith, thank you so much for joining us on Gamification Revolution. We'll see you at G Summit in June. Be sure to register, y'all, if you want to join us. Um, it'll be great to have you there. And in a couple of days' time, we'll be back here on Gamification Revolution with Mario Herker, um, who all of you know and love. Thanks again for being with us. We'll see you all soon. In the meantime, everyone, keep having fun. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.